This podcast may contain content that is graphic and disturbing in nature. Listener discretion is advised. An infant's tragic death is ruled a homicide, and his grieving mother suddenly finds herself at the mercy of the justice system. This is the Christina Curlis story. Happy Valentine's Day, Megan. Happy Heart Day, Amy. What'd you get me? <laughs> My presents. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fine. Wah, wah. No, we both don't celebrate this holiday, but to anyone who does celebrate it, happy Valentine's Day. I know. We sound like, um, we almost sounds like the Scrooge of Valentine's Day, but we, we both just, uh, you know, we like to show our love every day, right? <laughs> so nice. Megan, I don't know if you remember me mentioning this case, but I actually started writing this episode over two years ago. So you know how I go to the Innocence Network conference every yeah. year? Well, two two years ago at the conference, I was chatting with some people about wrongful conviction cases and someone brought up this case. And so I started looking into it, but unfortunately there was so little known about the case that I had to put it on hold because I simply just didn't have enough information to make it into an episode. And I assumed, you know, many cases at this time, and well, many cases in recent years, things were delayed because of COVID. So I assumed that is what happening. So I always kind of kept my ear out to hear if there was anything going on with this case. And finally, just a few weeks ago, some recent news came out. So I was able to pick it back up for this episode. That's exciting. So because this case was not widely covered, I just want to have a disclaimer now. I do not have the usual amount of backstory that we tend to provide. However, this case focuses on a very important topic that we will spend a lot of time discussing. Christina Carlos was born in 1990 and lived in Southwest Valley, Las Vegas, in Nevada. Christina worked for AT&T and was described as a loving mother of her four boys. As I said, we don't know much about her childhood or her background, but she had no criminal history and she was just living an average quiet life by all accounts. At the time of the event we are discussing, Christina was 29 years old and lived with her boyfriend, 27-year-old Giovanni Davis. He was the father of her two youngest boys. On the morning of October 5th, 2018, Giovanni woke up to find his two-month-old son, Jakai Davis, laying on his belly, crying and very irritable. Now, it's not abnormal for a tiny baby like that to wake up crying. However, Jakai went unresponsive after only a few minutes of fussing. So, of course, now it seems like there is something to panic about. Christina was taking her older child to school and received a frantic call from Giovanni about their son. She told him to call 911 immediately, which he did. The baby was rushed to Summerlin Hospital Medical Center in cardiac arrest, and he was diagnosed with a brain bleed. Tragically, Two days later, on October 7, 2018, he passed away. While this was a terrible tragedy at the time, it wasn't until eight months later, on July 25, 2019, that the Clark County Coroner's Office ruled the death a homicide due to blunt force head and neck trauma. Now, this seems a little strange, and I'm not exactly sure what happened in those eight months, but we have seen cases where sometimes an autopsy is not completed right away, or sometimes more evidence emerges to make police start investigating a death differently. But at the time when the baby passed away on October 7, 2018, the cause of death seemed unknown. They knew that the baby had cardiac arrest and there was this brain bleed, but it was just due to natural causes at this point. There was no suggestion of foul play. Amy, are you saying they didn't conduct the autopsy for eight months? So, Megan, there was this eight-month time lapse where, you know, the baby tragically passed away and there was no indication of foul play or anything other than, you know, this horrible, tragic death of a child. So for some reason, though, eight months later, the coroner's office made this ruling so the baby's autopsy produced evidence that Jakai had hemorrhaging in his brain, his eye area, and his spinal cord, along with healing nerve fractures on two of his ribs. Oh. They went further, though, Megan. The coroner's office said that he had died from evidence of shaken baby syndrome, also known as SBS. Now, this is essentially when an adult shakes an infant in anger or frustration to such a degree that it causes blunt force trauma. 
And we will spend a lot of time dissecting shaken baby syndrome and the validity of it later. So for now, just okay. hold your questions. As is protocol, both the Metro and the Department of Family Services opened investigations into the death. At this time, the police were investigating both Giovanni and Christina. And again, this is after the autopsy results. Detectives brought Christina in for questioning, and she told investigators that the evening of October 4th, which was the night before the baby's death, she had left him with Giovanni all day until she came home from work. She says once she was home, Giovanni went to the gym, and then the family went out to dinner together when he came home. She also said that Giovanni went to bed before she did, and she stayed up with the baby for a little while, and then she took the baby to bed with her when she went to sleep. Now, that night, she says that he slept next to her bed on a baby mattress on the home's carpeted floor. So have you seen these mattresses before? They're usually like in a crib, but sometimes parents will take them out of a crib and maybe put them on the floor. They're a small mattress, not very high off the ground. So I don't see any, there's no reason to um, be concerned that a baby would maybe fall off and have, you know, hit their head or something. Why? Oh, just to be closer to the infant. Is that why you take it out? Sometimes. I mean, some babies don't sleep well unless they're in the same room as the mother. And there's a lot of evidence that says it's not good to share a bed with a baby. So maybe she was doing the next best thing, keeping the baby in the room, um, but having him on the floor. Okay. I don't think we can make any judgment here on what her choices were for, you know, her baby to sleep. Definitely not um, uh, making a judgment. I just didn't literally understand why one would take. I, I was like, what would mm-hmm. be the purpose of that? Um, but yeah, comes across that I don't have kids, right? If you think about it, like a crib might be heavy and big. You can't like roll it into the room. But if she wanted the baby in the room with her, I'm actually not sure. OK. Either way, she says she woke up to find Jokai on the ground like he rolled off, quote, but he acted completely fine. The evening before, she had sent Giovanna a picture and then a video of the baby. According to one of the detectives, in the video, Jokai is upright, responsive, and interacting with her, while in the picture, the baby is, quote, slumped forward and his color looked off. An officer wrote in their report that between the 5 to 6 p.m. hour until 9 p.m., Christina was the baby's only caretaker, and that she had taken the video of the baby early in the evening and then took the photo where he, quote, appeared not right. The report further stated that Christina, quote, insisted on leaving the residence to go out to dinner, during which time she kept Jokai in his car seat. And she also kept him in his car seat when they came back home. And according to his father, that's where he was until Giovanni went to bed. I've done this before with my children. If a child is fussy, sometimes you just leave them in the car seat if they're happy because you can bring the car seat, right? It's almost like having like a baby seat in the house. So I don't think there's anything strange about the fact that she kept the baby in the car seat the whole time during dinner and also for a little while after she returned home. In fact, it's a pretty safe place to keep a child. If you have to do stuff around the house and you can't keep your eyes on the baby, you know they're safe in a car seat because they're secure. Right. Clark County Department of Family Services also had records indicating that first responders were initially called for, quote, a possible near drowning incident. Now, oddly, there was no mention of a drowning in Christina's arrest report at all. Other than a sentence noting that first responders stated that the child was not wet. Now, this is very strange and I do not have any other further information on this. I did want to throw that in there because it seems that it could be a crucial piece to this story. Certainly odd. Now, the day after the baby's death was ruled a homicide on July 26, 2019, Christina was booked into the Clark County Detention Center. It's not clear why only she was booked and not Giovanni. Now, she was charged on two felony counts, murder in the first degree and child abuse. Again, there is zero information about what the father of the baby, what he claimed happened or why he was let go and why she was held. These are all things that are not known and maybe they will eventually come out, but it seems to be a mystery. Christina was released after posting a $100,000 bail and she was put on house arrest with the CPS directed stipulation that she have no contact with any children under the age of 10. Now, due to possible COVID delays, as I mentioned earlier, Christina didn't get a preliminary hearing until January 31st of 2020. Now, the preliminary hearing gives the accused person the right to force the prosecution to provide sufficient evidence to believe that a crime was actually committed by the defendant. This process is also known as a probable cause hearing. Now, in Nevada, the same rules of evidence apply in a preliminary hearing as apply in the actual trial. 
So you have the defendant with the right to cross-examine the witnesses against them during this preliminary trial. Well, that's good. Now, most of the time when the state has its witness present, the defendant will waive their right to a preliminary hearing. And that's exactly what Christina did. So this means that she did not take the stand at the preliminary hearing. At the end of the preliminary hearing, the case file went from magistrate court to district court. And this is commonplace. Usually you have the magistrate court that handles all pretrial motions and hearings. Actually, sometimes they will reside over civil proceedings as well. But then the district court is where trials and sentencing are held. And in Nevada, like many states, felony trials take place in a district court and they are jury trials. Of course, the defendant may waive their right to a jury. Um, but in this case, Christina pled not guilty and she was headed for a jury trial. Christina's district court appearance date was initially set for February 4th, 2020. But the date got moved back several times over the next many months. Now, despite the preliminary hearing, there was no evidence against Christina. In fact, there was reasons to potentially suspect others if, in fact, anything nefarious had happened to the baby. Now, Christina's sister, Demi Carlis, alleged that Jokai was actually injured two weeks prior to his death at his daycare provider. Christina had reported the baby's injuries to the Metropolitan Police Department at the time of her noticing the injuries. According to the report, she also told police that the baby had, quote, a scratch and bruises on his ankle area when she picked him up from daycare. Further information regarding that report has not been made available, so I'm not sure if there were any other reports filed or any other suspected injuries. One source also said that Christina's nephew, who had attended the same daycare, also had unexplained injuries at some point. Now, Christina's defense team was hard at work. There were also many advocates who were working for her release. I'm assuming at some point we're going to find out what the evidence is, right? You're going to tell me because I'm OK. I'm like sitting on the edge of my seat going, I don't understand what's happening yet. OK. Yes. So as I mentioned, she has many advocates working for her. Um, Jason Flom was one of her many advocates. He had posted about her case on Instagram as well. And that was, you know, during this time where she was awaiting trial now, they had several experts that were working hard. They had a man by the name of Randy Papetti. Now, he's a civil attorney, but he does a lot of pro bono work in the area of shaken baby syndrome defense. He actually co-authored a book on the topic of shaken baby. And then there was also Dr. Evan Mashes, who is, who is a pediatric forensic pathologist. They have been instrumental in helping secure the exonerations of many individuals who have been convicted or charged of crimes claiming shaken baby syndrome. Now, while Christina's defense team was hardworking and she was waiting for her trial to come, in February of 2020, Giovanni filed for custody of their older children and he won. So unfortunately, you know, Christina was facing these charges. The trial was scheduled, was rescheduled again for January 2023. While Christina was able to secure bail, so she was in the community awaiting her trial, she was without her children. There was no new info on this case for many months, as I keep mentioning. And then I saw a second update on Christina's case on Jason Flom's Instagram. And this time there was big news. I need to know. Christina's charges were dropped. This just happened recently in late December of 2022. Remember, her trial was scheduled for just a few weeks later in early January 2023. So what I believed happened is after several defense motions were filed, the DA finally dropped all charges and her lawyer, along with the experts that we previously discussed, they were able to prove with scientific certainty that no harm was done to Joe Kai and he had actually died of a brain bleed due to a pre-existing medical condition. Oh, wait a second. There's a pre-existing condition too? Okay. I mean, how does this go down? The defense proved to the prosecution? Like, did they do a demonstration for them? You know, like what, how did this happen? So they were able to provide evidence that Joe Kai had sickle cell anemia. He also had an enlarged heart and a ruptured artery in his brain. And that is what led to the cardiac arrest that ultimately killed him. Now, the baby had been born prematurely and Christina knew that he was a carrier for sickle cell disease and she had even made arrangements for him to see a specialist. But this event happened before that appointment ever happened. Basically, they had these new experts come in. I don't know the exact details, but I would imagine they did an independent autopsy and they looked at other evidence and they were able to conclude that, unfortunately, um, this child had died as a result of this pre-existing condition. Seems like the original autopsy, whoever conducted it, should have caught some of these also other big things. I wonder if they did catch it and they just thought, 
that wasn't the cause or if they just didn't catch it at all. Yes, Megan, that's one of the big issues with shaken baby syndrome. When we get further into talking about shaken baby syndrome, we're going to talk about why in this case and in many others, foreigners are so quick to jump to that conclusion. Mm. After the charges were dropped, Christina put out a public statement saying, quote, after four years of fighting for my children, my case has been dismissed and now I can focus on recovering from this trauma and more importantly, mending my three children who are the genuine victims of this injustice. She also acknowledged that the court was doing the right thing and that they were finally seeing through the nonsense science of shaken baby syndrome. The issue here, Megan, is that even though she's currently absolved of the charges, the charges could be reinstated because they were dismissed without prejudice. Uh. So this essentially means that she could be retried. Basically, this just means that the case is temporarily dismissed. Now, oftentimes you won't see a prosecutor refiling these types of charges because it's unlikely that additional evidence will come back in their favor. But it still leaves that door open for Christina and her family. So Christina went on to say that she hopes that there is a method to dismiss this with prejudice. And of course, that would mean that she cannot be brought back to court on those charges. So her and her defense team are currently working on that. But either way, she acknowledged that this is unquestionably a victory for me and my defense unit. This win is significant, not just for me, but also for the majority of the medical community which is aware of the forensic unreliability of shaken baby syndrome, which leads to incorrect convictions. Lastly, she says, I hope that my case, trauma, and fight not only aid the other families who have been unfairly accused, but also give individuals the courage to continue fighting and speaking their truth. The reason I chose this case is because I wanted a place to talk about shaken baby syndrome, because that's the issue surrounding this case. Now, the shaken baby diagnosis, the shaken baby syndrome, the di that diagnosis is what caused all of Christina's trauma and suffering. It can be a very controversial medical diagnosis, and many people don't know, but it has led to several wrongful convictions. So, for example, since 2001, there have been about 2,000 cases where defendants were charged with shaken baby syndrome. And out of those, 213 cases saw charges dropped or dismissed or convictions were later overturned. Mm. And this always happens after you have a secondary analysis that show that the victim had actually been suffering from something else. Amy, what what's the evidence that that leads people to this diagnosis or misdiagnosis? Like what what what's going on? I don't know much about this issue actually in terms of, you know, how they determine that a baby has been shaken. Okay, so often when a defendant is suspected of shaking an infant to death, the medical expert checks whether the victim has the following three symptoms. This is what's known as the classic triad. So usually if these symptoms are all present at once and it's considered to fall under the umbrella of shaken baby syndrome. So the first one is retinal hemorrhage. That's bleeding of the inside surface of the back of the eye. Mm -hmm. The other is subdural hemorrhaging, which is bleeding between the hard outer layer and the spongy membranes that surround the brain. And the third is cerebral edema, which is essentially brain swelling. So in this particular case, it seems once the coroner saw the retinal bleeding, that's when that this diagnosis of shaken baby syndrome came out, even without having these other two in the triad. It was really this retinal bleeding. Now, I don't know for sure what caused this in the baby. However, sickle cells can block blood flow in small blood vessels, therefore depriving the eye of oxygen and then cause damage. It's something called sickle retinopathy. Okay, that explains maybe the bruising, but you also said that his ribs were fractured. Megan, that's a really good point. And I think that was something that the defense had to explain because that's a big part of this. So infants, they were able to show that infants occasionally sustain bone fractures during childbirth, which may account for the baby's nerve fractured ribs. Not to mention that many infant injuries can be sustained up to 72 hours before their death. The defense was able to show that infants occasionally sustain bone fractures during childbirth, which may account for the baby's rib injuries. Another issue concerns injuries caused by short falls. So many experts say that short falls cannot cause death or injuries diagnosed as shaken baby syndrome. However, recent studies have shown that short falls can cause similar head trauma to the symptoms of shaken baby syndrome. Could this be the fall from the mattress? Exactly. Even though it was a short fall, because again, it, the mattress wasn't that high off the ground, experts are saying that short falls can mimic shaken baby syndrome as well. Mm. So there's a lot of issues here. I think at the very least, there's reasonable doubt. Oh, yeah. 
But shaken baby syndrome is really at the heart of the issue because there have been many other cases where people have been wrongfully convicted using shaken baby claims. And in a lot of these cases, Megan, it actually ended up being complications due to sickle cell anemia. Oh, So for example, there's a case of Melanie Ware. She was a daycare provider in Georgia and she was sentenced to life after she was found guilty of shaking a child when in fact, it turns out that the baby in this case had died as a result of medical complications from a pre-existing medical condition and that being sickle cell anemia. In this case, luckily she was exonerated, but she still spent five years before she was acquitted. One of the better known shaken baby wrongful convictions is that of Audrey Edmonds. This is a case out of Wisconsin. In 1996, she was a neighborhood babysitter provider. So she had like, um, you know, a child care business that yeah. she ran out of her home. Yeah. So she had her neighbor's child in her care. And out of nowhere, the child seemed to become unresponsive. So she did what anyone would do. And she took the child straight to the hospital. Now, despite no signs of external injuries and no witnesses who said that she ever hurt that infant or any other infant, she was convicted and sentenced to 18 years in prison. And this was purely based on the testimony of medical professionals claiming shaken baby syndrome. Now, prosecution experts had testified that the infant's injuries could not have been accidental. They said they were equivalent to a major car crash. However, the Wisconsin Innocence Project found experts who said that new research casts doubts about the trial evidence. So in particular, in this case, the fatal head injuries that were thought to have been shaken baby syndrome could have been caused earlier when the child was out of Audrey Edmonds' care. Mm -hmm. In other words, if a baby sustains injury within 72 hours, it could appear as if it's a fresh injury. So then, Amy, how come they chose how come they chose Christina and not her boyfriend? Or her, was it her husband or her boyfriend? It was her boyfriend. I have no idea, Megan. That's what I said about the lack of information in this case. Oh, and okay. again, right. I, I shied away from covering it because of that. But, you know, I did want to talk about okay. shaken baby syndrome. And I guess there are several cases we could have highlighted. But this is a case that has somewhat of a happy ending in the sense that the charges against Christina were dropped before she spent time in prison. So unlike Audrey Edmonds, who served 12 years, you know, it could have been much worse. I mean, there's even the case of Sabrina Butler, mm -hmm who was the first female death row exoneree. That was another case, um, which I'll definitely cover. That's been on my list forever. So the last thing I want to discuss is no crime wrongful convictions. We've spoken about this in several cases, and we even had Jessica Henry come talk, right? Mm. Jessica Henry wrote the book Smoke But No Fire yes. about no crime wrongful convictions. Yes. And those of you who didn't get a chance to listen to that or who may not know what I'm talking about, a no crime wrongful conviction is when somebody is convicted of a, something that was never even a crime. So there's a difference between a wrong person case and a no crime case. So in a wrong person case, someone may be exonerated because they didn't commit the crime, but somebody else did. No crime is there simply no crime that ever happened. For example, in this case, Patricia Stallings, another case we yes. covered where her baby died of an undiagnosed medical condition and she was charged with poisoning the baby. It was only discovered, too, that her baby wasn't poisoned, if I'm not mistaken, because she had a second baby who had the same condition. Is that correct? Exactly. So her second child essentially saved her life because the second child had the same medical complications and they were able to, through that child, they were able to show that the child who was deceased actually had the same very rare genetic disorder. Right. So when we talk about this subset of cases, you know, their arson will fall under this, like Joanne Park's case. That's another no crime wrongful conviction. She was convicted of murder and arson of her children, but it turns out it was an accidental fire. So again, that's what makes it a no crime wrongful conviction. Now, very common in this subset of no crime wrongful convictions is cases of injury, illness, or death in children that is often attributable to a rare or difficult to diagnose medical disorder. Now, the problem is, Megan, that abuse is not a medical condition, right? However, you have doctors who are often paid to testify to, quote, diagnose abuse. Right. And you simply can't diagnose abuse, right? I don't think in the traditional, like not in the way that you're you're saying, no, you can't. Now, if they believe that Christina Curlis, in fact, harmed her child, then they're only going to look at evidence that confirms their belief that she was a bad mother or that she was in some way abusive and ignore any evidence to the contrary. So the evidence here is basically the triad. He had, he had, the baby had the presence of the medical triad that was 
always thought to be indicative of shaken baby syndrome. Okay. At least I understand what you're saying the evidence is. It's not clear that he had the actual triad. Now, he did have the retinal hemorrhaging. He did have brain bleeding. And I'm not 100% certain about the brain swelling. Okay. But the coroner really focused on that retinal hemorrhaging. That seemed to be the piece that stuck out to him. I wonder what retinal hemorrhaging, I wonder what other conditions that could imply or what other, you know, I'm sure there's a number of other situations in which someone, and I don't know how many of them, could sustain retinal hem- hemorrhaging yeah. or could experience it. Remember I said it's common in sickle cell patients. Yes, yes. Yeah, I know you said that. I was just wondering of if, like, I'm wondering, are there other conditions? Yeah, or other medical conditions, other, you know, any conditions, really, in which someone could sustain that. Yeah, and we've seen in previous cases that sometimes life-saving efforts can result in injuries that might mimic some sort of trauma or abuse as well. Yes, absolutely. So although this is tragic, Christina is actually one of the lucky ones because many mothers and, you know, fathers and other caregivers, but overwhelmingly we see mothers who have been accused of shaken baby syndrome, and many of them are still serving time and they are likely innocent. And as successful as Christina and her defense team were at getting her charges dropped, she was still wrongfully accused. And instead of being able to grieve the death of her infant son, her life was torn apart The rest of her children were taken away from her and her three surviving children, they lost their little brother and they had no mother to lean on for several years. As a mother, I could not imagine what Christina must have endured during those four long years of fighting for her innocence. This is an all round tragedy in every regard. You know, I always think about this, too, when we talk about these cases, the no no, uh, just wrongful conviction cases as well. When someone has lost, you know, a child or a spouse or one of the people closest to them. And then they can't grieve because they have to fight for their own life. They're, you know, h- how does that affect them then later on, too? That's like trauma on top of trauma, you know, the delayed grief. And it's just really awful all around. You know, I hope that by bringing light to Christina's case, we can spread more information about these types of issues. And, you know, the more we talk about them, the more people who are potential jurors can learn about the inaccuracy of some of these, you know, what people would consider junk science. No crime wrongful convictions are ones that, um, I mean, I gave a lecture, I think on it, maybe last year or something. I wasn't even, they weren't even on my radar for until probably the last few years. I don't know. And how about you as a wrongful conviction researcher? Have you always been kind of interested in those crimes as well? Or did they only come on your radar recently as well? Um, So they've always been around. Um, There's been a lot more research now that shows us that we have overwhelmingly, you see women who and women who are caregivers who fall into this area. And it's often people being convicted of crimes against loved ones. Yeah. And as we talked about, those are, you know, the most difficult ones. Yeah. Also, when you think about a no crime wrongful conviction, these are such a waste of resource, right? Because essentially you have police, detectives, investigators trying to solve something that's not a crime to begin with. So they're using extra manpower and extra resources to try to solve something that's not solvable in the sense that it's not a crime. Right. So it's a real, it's a big waste of resources. It is. It's a shame, but it's not intentional. And of course, there are cases that need to be investigated because there are parents who have murdered their children, have shaken their children. Absolutely. So it's, I mean, I think it's hard, it's a hard balance um, here to figure out how, how hard to push. I would certainly say when there's not overwhelming evidence, you know, I think people just can't accept also like the, the loss of a small child. It's inexplicable. Mm-hmm. So I think there's, you know, a reason why everyone goes or sometimes police officers might go to, you know, guilty and someone had to do something. There's also another option, isn't there, Amy, that I mean, if it, there's not a medical condition and it is not the fault of, you know, an external person, a parent or someone having abused or, you know, shaken a baby. We see a diagnosis of SIDS when it's when we have inexplicable cases as well. So I wonder SIDS being sudden infant death syndrome. And that really just means, right, that there's a sudden infant death and we don't know the cause. I wonder what differentiates the SIDS cases from, you know, the SIDS cases versus the ones where, you know, there's a prosecution. I wonder what the characteristics are. Do you know what I mean? It's probably any evidence of the brain bleed, the retinal hemorrhaging, um, the bleeding on Mm -hmm. the brain. I think those are usually red flags. And I want to just highlight something that you said that I think we glossed over a little too quickly. The importance of, and sometimes I get, you know, sometimes I get carried away and forget to talk about 
the importance of still being able to use science in a good way because there are, as you mentioned, there are cases of shaken baby syndrome. I just think it's important, as you mentioned, that we don't disregard any evidence of trauma. All right. Well, I have never heard of this case um, and I had not I really didn't know the conditions under which someone, uh, a child, would be diagnosed with shaken baby syndrome. So you definitely shed some light on this issue for me as well, Amy. Thank you for bringing it to our attention. All right. Before we go today, we do have a listener question. Okay. This question is a little lighter. Good. Whose idea was it to do a podcast and how did you come up with Women in Crime? Megan, I feel like you have this rehearsed already, so you could go ahead and give the abridged version. Yeah, I can. I can tell you also that James thinks it was his idea, but we disagree on that one, James and I. I think it probably I really don't think so. I'm actually almost positive it wasn't, but the original idea came from Direct Appeal when we uh, met Melanie McGuire and she wanted to tell her story about a potential wrongful conviction. And I just had no idea what to do with her story. And when I mentioned it to James, he suggested a podcast. And um, I was like, I have no idea what I'm doing. I don't know anything about podcasting. But I knew that Amy knew a lot about podcasts because she was totally into podcasts then. And I just knew that the way we talk about subjects would be would be a natural translation over to a podcast. So that's really how it came. You know, it was just an idea from James and getting Amy on board. Thankfully, you agreed. And we did direct appeal. And then after direct appeal, we got so many emails and so many messages From people asking us to please look into certain cases or explain what happened with female victims, female offenders. And I just knew we couldn't do a deep dive on all of them. So I was like, oh, well, why don't we just do, you know, women in crime where we cover a different case each time and we can give all these people attention or not everyone, but, you know, as many people as we possibly can. Mm -hmm. And that's where women in crime came from, even though James says it was his idea. (laughs) Oh, and it's also I mean, I teach the class women in crime. So it was also very natural for me to think, oh, yeah, I teach a whole course on this in which we cover so many of these topics. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we love it. So I I think it just worked out so well because I think we love the opportunity to cover different cases all the time and different. You know, we have passion topics that we get to cover, which is great. And we also get to learn so much. I agree. Every single episode I cover, I learn something new. That's true. And I, you know, you and I are both lifelong learners. So it's good for us. A great educational experience all around. Yes. Thank you so much for that question. And thank you all so much for listening today. And we will catch you next time on Women in Crime. Women in Crime is written and hosted by Megan Sachs and Amy Schlossberg. Our producer is James Varga, edited by Jose Alfonso. Music composition is by Dessert Media. If you enjoy the show, please remember to subscribe and leave a review. You can also support the show through Patreon, where you can get access to additional ad-free content such as virtual happy hours and an extra full-length episode each month. For more information, visit patreon.com slash women in crime. Sources for today's episode include Las Vegas Review Journal, KTNV Las Vegas, leg.state.nv, docketalarm.com, WNYC Studios, ncbi.nih.gov.